Today I get to fly on a jet that was originally designed for war. Now NASA is using it for a peaceful mission, but the stakes are just as high. If you can write down our time at the 5,000 foot mark, it's a 5,243. Our task is to collect air samples that measure greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the main cause of climate change. Okay, you have the controls. I have the airplane. Yeah, you can take this canyon right here. Wouldn't want to miss this. Beautiful thing. For over 20 years, I've served on the board of Conservation International. So this isn't the first time I've worried about threats to our planet. But this is a chance for me to see up close how scientists study climate change and what it all means. You were measuring for us methane and CO2. When you see these levels going up, you're a climate scientist. How do you feel about uh, about what's happening? Personally, it's pretty scary. Yeah. Nah. The world is going to be suffering in a lot of ways mm -hmm. from this physical reality for a long time to come. It's 10 a.m. on March 16th, 2013. This has become a weekly ritual. Each Saturday, these people walk the four miles around the Cargill meatpacking plant on the edge of town. They're praying for rain and for the plant to reopen. Six weeks ago, it closed, and overnight, 10% of the area's entire workforce was laid off. It shut down because of a three-year drought that devastated the cattle herd here in Texas. And without cows, you can't run a meatpacking plant. Father, we, we pray for the situation in Cargill, my God. Because as you bring the moisture, as you bring the rain, conditions will, will change, my God. Because it's your rain, it's your spirit. That in a lot of the country, something like a drought is seen as an act of God or part of a natural cycle. But where I live, in Los Angeles, it seems like any kind of extreme weather gets blamed on climate change. Sometimes it feels like we live in two different countries. I want to know what the truth is about this drought. Look at that. And if it's possible for these two sides to talk to each other. So I'm heading to Texas to find out. I'm less than an hour's drive from the Syrian border. On the other side, a civil war is raging, the world's deadliest conflict. I'll introduce myself. I, I work as a, as a medic and safety consultant. I served in the Balkans, in Sarajevo, Afghanistan. This will be my 10th trip into Syria. But I'm not here to write about the latest battle. There's a different disaster I'm interested in. 
One I hope will tell me something about the real roots of this conflict. Khabur River starts from Syrian city of Ras al Ain, and it ends with Euphrates River. Gotcha. It feeds into the Euphrates. Yeah, obviously. that area people they really suffered from uh, the drought. The rain average started to reduce, uh, re reduce heavily, and it stopped totally. The it actually stopped. Yeah. Wow. But uh, I remember how it was because we used to go to swim there. Huh. Yeah. And then not anymore. <laughs> Four years before the civil war started. Syria was hit by a drought that lasted until just before the revolution. A drought so devastating that it altered the lives of millions of Syrians. There's a man on the other side of that border who can tell me about it. I just have to get there. The, the nearest Syrian army troops? Uh, here. Nobody really knows we're coming. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. data we collected with that jet, plus a lot more, all comes here to NASA's advanced supercomputing facility in Northern California. These days, the most jaw-dropping images coming out of NASA aren't of Mars or the moon, but of what's happening to our own planet. So here is a picture of the plant growth. You have droughts going on in the Midwest, in Russia, in Brazil, in Argentina. Three bread baskets, the corn belt, Ukraine, Russia, wheat belt, and down here in, in Argentina, the soy corn belt's all underperforming under drought. This is actual data, not a projection. Yes. Can we connect this drought to, to man-made uh, climate change? Greenhouse gases are, are, are changing them. And the greenhouse gases come from the burning of fossil fuels, and they come from cars and From planes, deforestation. And, yeah. and coal-fired plants. Exactly. Well, yes. How does that play out in the United States over the next few years? Here we're looking at historical climate, July 1950. These are high temperatures. As you can see, only a few areas, like in Arizona, we have 100 plus degrees you know, in yeah. July. But as we go into the future, the models predict those really hot areas to be growing. Just so you can see how the high temperatures are spreading across the country. And imagine the impact of those temperatures where we produce food. Wow. Imagine, Harrison, that Fargo, North Dakota, is like Phoenix. Those agricultural areas in the Midwest, they won't be. Degrees. These are conservative yes. projections by the world's leading scientists. And one of the biggest causes of this is something astonishing. 20% of all the emissions you know, come from deforestation each year. 
that, that's a big number. It turns out that deforestation accounts for about the same amount of emissions as cars, planes, in fact, all the transportation on the entire planet. That's because living trees breathe in and store carbon as they grow. But when they die, they release that carbon back into the atmosphere. More carbon in the air means more global warming. And every couple of years, enough forest to cover all of Germany is lost forever. This picture is of forest loss colored by year. The best country in terms of reducing deforestation has been Brazil. At the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of the highest rate of increase per year is Indonesia. It's kind of a double whammy for climate change. Because first they cut the trees that have been taking in the carbon. Right. And then they slash and burn uh, the landscape. And that releases right. so-called black carbon. So much forest is being burned there that you can see the smoke from space. So is it legal to set these fires? No. Under Indonesian law, it is illegal. And what are they being cleared for? They're, they're cleared for two products, palm oil and paper. Everybody knows we cut down trees to make paper. But palm oil? Snack food, cereals, cakes, processed foods, candy bars, cookies, Cheez-Its, Oreos, soaps, shampoos. It's pretty much on every aisle of most supermarkets. You'll find palm oil in there. Palm oil comes from the fruit of oil palm trees. Lafcadio Cortese of Rainforest Action Network tells me that almost all of those palm trees are grown on land that used to be forest. It's not the oil that's bad. It's how the oil is produced. Companies need to find out where their palm oil is coming from, and they need to make a commitment. We're not going to contribute to climate change and deforestation, and then look at their supply chains and prove that. Lafcadio says demand for palm oil is growing faster than any other agricultural commodity. And in Indonesia, that means even more incentive to destroy forests. I'm going there to find out more. On my way to Texas, the signs of drought are clear. Ranchers here were among the first to feel its effects. Good to see you. Yep. One of them, Monty Best, has been here his whole life. So this is uh, one of your spots, right? This is one of my spots right here. How big yeah. of an expanse? There's 17,000 acres here wow. on this ranch. 17,000? Yeah. yeah, this is where I started out right here. I thought it needed to rain last year. It's got to rain this time. I thought it was just another dry spell and we'd be out of it, but it's more than a dry spell. Monty tells me he's had to sell two-thirds of his stock just to stay in business. And he's not alone. Across the border in Texas, where I'm headed, the cattle herd is at its lowest level in more than half a century, down by more than two million cows. Which is why that meatpacking plant in Plainview had to close. When I arrive, it's clear this isn't a big town. Just 22,000 people. So I figure something that killed 2,300 jobs in a single day has got to be affecting just about everyone. What role did climate change play in the drought that led to all this? What do the people here think? I pay a visit to one of the laid-off workers, Nelly Montez. Hey, Don. Hi. So this is where I grew up. I've lived here all my life. My kids were born and raised right here wow. in this house. So this is my mom and dad's house. Mom and dad right yeah. next door? Oh, that's nice. See, a lot of the, the businesses have already closed down and stuff. Did you ever see it coming? I mean, the plant no. closures. Cargill's the main source of income in Plainview. Oh. That can't happen. That day, when they told us, they took us into the cafeteria. Yeah, what was that like? Oh, my god. That was just unreal. It was like they rounded up a, 
herd of cattle in a pen and just hit us over the head with it. This is it. This is home, sweet home. Well, home away from home, right? Home away from home. Nellie told me it was a good job. She saved enough money to buy a house and for the first time in her life wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. But when they told me it's over, I'm going like, what can I do, mm. you know? Who's gonna hire a 46-year-old woman as a forklift driver? What, what do you think, what do you think the reason was for the drought. I mean, do you attribute it to anything? Do you think about that? Um, my only thought was, I think it's biblical. Biblical? I really do. Religion plays a big role in Plainview. There are over 70 churches in town, and I discover that believing the drought is God's will or part of a natural cycle is common here. As I talk to more and more of the locals, it doesn't seem like anyone thinks humans could be affecting the climate. I think it's the cycle. Uh, everything runs in 20-year cycles. There's only one man that knows how much rain we're gonna get, and that's God, and he's not a scientist, so I'm not putting much faith in what they say. <laughs> Genesis 9 says that there will always be seed time and harvest. And this business of these people saying that there's going to be a calamity in weather is not true. But what if it is true? What if global warming is the reason all these people here lost their jobs? I've spent decades reporting on the Middle East, but I have to say, the events in Syria these days are some of the most heartbreaking I have ever seen. I thought I knew how it all started with protests over government repression and widespread poverty in early 2011. Hi. Tom Friedman. Thanks Hi. for coming. Thank you. But then I met Farah Nassif, a young Syrian refugee living here in Washington, D.C., and she made me wonder if there might be a lot more to this story. They are talking about drought when I was young. I was uh, 11 or something like this. She told me that before the Civil War, she had lived through another disaster. So is this year after year, less year rain? Year after year, government doesn't try to help in any kind of way. And that the government's response made people so angry, they were eager to take to the streets. She said, I couldn't understand the Civil War if I didn't understand what happened in the drought. Most of uh, farmers, they leave to Damascus, to homes. So they uh, move from the countryside yeah, yes. to the city? To the city. They live in very poor area on Damascus. Like you can find 10 persons in one room. Wow. If you, if you notice that most of uh, people in revolution, they are from countryside, countryside really? of Syria. Later, I learned that this drought was the worst in Syria's modern history and that it happened in the four years just before the revolution. Over a million people were displaced, and according to the United Nations, more than two million were forced into extreme poverty. It's really scary. scary. And this drought was part of a trend. According to a study by the U.S. government's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, over the last 40 years, climate change has caused the Mediterranean region to dry up resulting in longer, more severe droughts. The places in red are getting the worst of it, and Syria is right at the epicenter. I also come across a confidential U.S. diplomatic cable written two years before the revolution. It contains some dire predictions. A U.N. official stationed in Syria feared the drought would throw the entire country into chaos. Can there really be a connection between a drought and a civil war? Hey, it's Thomas Friedman from the New York Times. Climate 
change is now well understood to be a major national security issue and a source of uh, stress on a number of the underlying causes of conflict. Drought, floods, food shortages, water scarcity, all of these drive increased uh, human insecurity, poverty, uh, and can contribute to conflict. How much do you feel that stress in northern Syria, where you have this region afflicted by drought from 2006 to 2010, right on the eve of the revolution there, um, contributed to it? It's very hard to, to quantify. However, we all know that you know, where there is drought, where there is insecurity, when there is poverty, hunger, poor governance, repressive policies, that may make the tinder in the box uh, more uh, readily uh, ig ignitable. In other words, if a drought is bad enough, it can help push an already stressed society to the breaking point. Is that what happened in Syria? by this, palm trees for palm oil. These plantations may look lush, but they take the place of dense jungles that were storing carbon for hundreds of years. The palm trees will only grow for 25 years before being cut down and burned again, releasing all their carbon into the atmosphere. But even that isn't the worst of it. In Borneo, one of Indonesia's many islands, two people are waiting to show me more. by Rizal Kusumabaja. Rizal and his business partner, Darsono Hartono, are taking me to a remote piece of forest that they're trying to save. Distinguished primatologist and president of Conservation International, which has focused on climate change and deforestation for many years. Rizal and Darsono tell me that the most remarkable and precious thing about this jungle is right under our feet. What we're walking on isn't mud. It's a thick layer of compressed, decaying vegetation called peat. Many of Indonesia's forests sit on peat, and peat is full of carbon. So what are these guys doing here? Getting a core sample of some kind of, of the peat, right? That's correct. You're going to send it to a laboratory? or you're Yes, gonna... we have to test the, what we call the bulk density right. and the yeah. organic uh, carbon content. In a typical peat sampling, yeah. if you measure one meter by mm -hmm. one meter and one meter, that's one cubic meter, 
it consists between 45 kilograms to 90 kilograms of, of carbon dioxide. Of carbon. Of yeah. carbon. Does peat contain the, the same amount of carbon as, as a regular forest? Peat can be 10 times as much. And if there's a fire in this forest, the peat will burn too, releasing all that stored carbon into the air. Peat fires are almost impossible to extinguish. They can smolder for years. What's the total contained in this area that you're trying to protect? We have estimated almost a billion tons of carbon dioxide. You live in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. So I think Los Angeles have five million cars. Take one third out the cars, and that's the kind of emission that we're preventing. Wow. That's a lot of cars. And that's just this area. In total, the destruction of Indonesia's peatlands accounts for an astonishing 4% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. But after five years of trying to protect this one peat forest, they still haven't succeeded. What's the problem? Why aren't we doing it? One of the biggest problems that we've been facing the past five years is to get the rights to the land, the lease of the land from the okay. government. It's not being granted. Why? The Minister of Forestry have to sign these concession rights. But the paper that he has to sign has yeah. been sitting there for um, over a year, I think. Everybody knows that corruption is a problem in Indonesia. One of the big source of corruption is actually the forestry sector, just because they hold a lot of land. We never heard directly from the minister in terms of what kinds of things that he wants from us. But we have heard from other people that because it is a big area, we have to give something up. Give something up. Give something up. In other words, they hear that officials in the forest ministry may be looking for a bribe. It's happened here in the past. I want to meet the minister in charge. But there's a lot more to see first. The drought that caused the plant in Plainview to close wasn't just limited to Texas. At its height, it covered two-thirds of the continental U.S. I was looking for someone who could help me understand what caused it. And I found her, one town over at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. Catherine Hayhoe is one of the top climate scientists in the world. She's written more than 60 peer-reviewed publications, and one of her specialties is drought. Here in West Texas, it's feast or famine. We have years when it's dry as a bone. We have years when it's record flooding. And that's just the way it's always been as far back as we go. So just to give an example, here in Lubbock, we only have about nine or 10 days a year over 100 degrees on average. In 2011, we had almost 50 days over 100. And that is going to be the typical summer by the middle of the century if we continue on our current pathway. So what happens if you take that exact natural cycle of drought, wet, drought, wet, and you make it hotter? Well, when it's dry, all that extra temperature is going to cause even more water to evaporate. Mm -hmm. It's going to dry out the soil even more. Mm -hmm. So the average drought is going to become more severe as it gets warmer. The question then is, what's causing it to change? There's what I call four usual suspects that we know have done it before. Natural cycles is number one, mm -hmm. suspect number one. The sun is suspect number two, because that's where we get all our energy from. So how do we know it's not the sun? It's because we can actually look at the sun's energy. We've been measuring it. Mm -hmm. So we have this regular cycle, right? But we also have these long-term changes where it was getting, giving us more and more energy up until about the 1970s, and then it started to go down. And this is our temperature. Our temperature actually kept on going up. So it's not the sun. Can't be the sun. Roll the sun out. We would be going down. We'd be getting cooler right. if it was the sun. Right. We know it's not volcanoes because volcanoes just cool the Earth when they erupt. What about natural cycles? You see these regular cycles every 100,000 years or so. Right. And you see the cycles in temperature and in carbon dioxide. We see that temperature and carbon dioxide track together. Mm -hmm. We also see that right now we are way out of the ballpark. CO2 is out of the ballpark because of human activity. Right, so, you know, and the Earth's temperature you know. is rising right along with it. So the bottom line is the natural suspects all have alibis. 
We can't blame it on natural cycles, the sun, the ice ages, volcanoes. Mm. Natural causes would be causing us to cool right now. And we're getting warmer faster and faster. We're heading into an unknown future like we have never put ourselves in before. As I leave town, I wonder how people in Plainview would react to what she just told me. Would they see a conflict between her science and their faith? Catherine doesn't see a conflict. Father, thank you for this morning. Just thank you for this uh, breakfast. She's a devout Christian her. herself. Amen. On my way to Syria, I learned about a family that recently fled the war and is now taking refuge here. كان عندنا اراضي زراعيه كانت في يعني الامطار كانت حيل زينه يعني كانت امطار سنويه حيل زينه تمطر علينا بمطر بهي كانت الاراضي حيل مرويه بعدين فجاه صار فيها الجفاف هذا ارض قحله صارت ملحه يعني شوفي يعني قد ما اوصف لك ما راح تنوصف على هالشيء هذا اللي شفناه 17 سنه تقريبا يعني انه فقدنا الارض حولنا من عيشه لعيشه Had you ever seen anything like that before? لا يعني ما يعني انا الي سنين يعني نزرع وهي بحياته ما مر علينا هالجفاف هاي اول مره يصير عندنا هالجفاف هذا اول مره احنا كنا قاعدين بالدوام وعم نحكي انه في قحل وفي جفاف لازم العالم لازم الحكومه تساعد بس ما حدا عم يستجيب بالعكس اجوا اخذونا على التحقيق وعلى الاساس يوم الثاني وفي الاخير اعتقلونا لمده شهرين اعتقلونا لمده شهرين اخذوهم ما اعتقلوها وحطوها بالسجن يعني شيء صعب وبعدين طلعنا على الاساس انه ما حد يحكي نهائيا مع اول صيحه الله اكبر احنا كلياتنا قمنا للثوره مباشرة بعدين أنا كنت مرابطة يعني من المرابطين بالثورة بس من انصاب ابني محمد أخذته وطلعت فيه على لهون على تركيا And what are your plans now? You want to go back and rejoin your your comrades and and continue the revolution? أكيد أرجع وكمل ما الشيء اللي مشينا عليه بالأول الشيء اللي حلفنا عليه من الأول How many other Syrians, I wonder, have a similar story to tell? The answer is on the other side of that border. I'm told there's a rebel commander leading a group of failed farmers turned fighters. That's where I'm heading. To truly understand deforestation here, it's important to know this country's history. 
The dictatorship that was in power from the 1960s to the 90s seized huge swaths of land from indigenous peoples by labeling them state forest, then parceled them out to big companies. The companies leveled the forest. But then a few years ago, it seemed like things were taking a turn for the better the country's president declared a moratorium on the destruction of all natural forests. By saving, regenerating, and sustainably managing forests, we are also doing our part in reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. But the cutting and burning continued. In fact, it accelerated. It seems as if the president's authority was limited. Perhaps there was too much money to be made. These people from the World Wildlife Fund are bringing me to a beautiful place called Tesonilo. Conservation International and WWF worked for years to get it declared a national park. The government, specifically the forestry minister, would then be responsible for protecting it. But when it was named a park 10 years ago, that didn't stop the palm oil invasion we realized that there was a huge elephant herd in this province that nobody was taking care of. There were conflicts with the oil palm companies and these elephants in the surrounding area. Yeah. So what do they do about the elephants? They poison them. We found groups of up to 21 elephants dead. It's clear that what's happening to these elephants and this forest is deeply connected to our own future because of climate change. Extinction is happening, and we are watching right here. There's nothing else in Sumatra left of this ecosystem. This is the last spot, and it's going, going, going. It's important to experience this paradise first, to appreciate what comes next, the destruction. People view science and faith as being deeply divided. But for me, growing up with a dad who was a scientist, who was also a missionary, and who was very active in the church, um, I grew up with the understanding that there was no conflict. By studying science, we're studying what God was thinking when he created the universe. I've never heard of anyone like Catherine Hayhoe, an evangelical climate scientist. She's made it her mission to explain the science of climate change to people of faith. Every major faith at its core has the idea that you should take care of people who have less than you do. If you look around the world, we're seeing things happening that are affecting our global neighbors. The only sensible response is reducing our own contribution, taking care of those that we can, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. We've been digging this stuff up from way under the ground, where it would normally stay for about a million years, and we've been putting it into the atmosphere really, really quickly. You know, I've, I've been a Christian since, you know, I was, can remember. Mm -hmm. really. Even students ask her how to square science and faith. I feel like, of course, God's in control, but he's given us the freedom to make choices. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing the consequences of choices we made. But it's often difficult to sow these seeds in the hard-baked political terrain of Texas. Those that want to take the position that global warming is man's fault and it is incontrovertible, that's not correct. Why would I put our children's future in jeopardy on science that frankly is not proven? And, and just because there is a, a, a large number of scientists that stand up and say, oh, it is, it's man's fault and, and that is that. What frustrates me and what actually makes me angry is not when people disagree with me. What makes me angry is when I see people who I know know better deliberately lying to people about this issue. 
And so when I see people telling other people, climate hasn't changed, global warming has stopped, God would never let this happen to the planet. Well, oh yeah, look around. There's a lot of bad things that happen to the planet every single day. Does God let those happen? Yeah, he does. Why? Because he gave us the brains to make good and bad choices. I believe that as long as you've got God there, he's going to guide you to the next the next step. So over the next period of a couple of weeks, I started praying, and like that, instantly, I just felt peace. Mm. So to me, it felt like there was it, a was, reason. it was confirmation. That's yeah. good. So, so that's... you're going to the next step with strength. <laughs> that next step is leaving Plainview. There are just no jobs here. Three months after the plant closed, Nellie moves in with her brother and his family in San Antonio. But things still aren't looking up. I've, I've been hurt the last two months. My finances, mainly. She can't find anyone to buy her old house back in Plainview. So she's fallen behind on the mortgage and the bank's threatening foreclosure. And her new job in an appliance warehouse doesn't pay much. My unemployment ran out, so all I had in savings was a month's worth. I've got to take the best offer that they give me, and the best one was where I'm working now. And that's $12 an hour. That doesn't compare to what I was making back home in Plainview. for rain and we hope for rain because the reality is nothing grows without rain. God has set it up so that a sprinkle of rain falls on the soil and from that soil comes up fruit, plants, vegetables, life. Catherine wants to introduce me to her first climate change convert. This water is the truth of the gospel and that's why we're here this morning. Soak it in. It's this evangelical preacher, Drew Farley, who also happens to be her husband. It wasn't until after Drew and I got married that I actually realized that he didn't think climate change is real. And not only that, but that many of the people that I was getting to know in church didn't think it was real. A lot of my political opinions are Republican. I'm a Christian. Um, I believe God created the world. Um, you know, I, I'm conservative in many ways. And I also believe that climate change is real. It seems like the same people that don't want to believe in that science believe in science when they need to take a pill or believe in science mm. when they, you know, want something to, to work right in their house that's attributable to other smart people who put that together. But right. in this issue, it's got to be a part of something else. Unfortunately, it's gotten so... The politics and then the questions about God and then the climate change, it's all just become this ball of sound bites. Yeah. Uh, and, and people can't parse it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then and I guess that's really what it, what it is, is that if you accept climate change, then I have to vote for Obama. Yeah. Or, right. <laughs> if I say it's if I say it's, you know, it's it's not real, then I can stay with my political affiliation. I can stay with the church and everything is all good, because mm -hmm. really what most people want to do, I think, is avoid conflict. You know, a, a thermometer is not Republican. A thermometer is not Democrat. The more time I spend here, the more I wonder, is there a way to discuss climate change without politics or religion getting in the way? Could this kind of discussion happen in Plainview? At least two explosions, most likely car bombs in a town along Turkey's border with Syria. While the details of this attack are still coming out, today's attack raises fears that Syria's brutal civil war may be crossing into neighboring Turkey now. As we prepare to leave, there's a major bombing on our side of the border, just a few towns over. I think it's the worst uh, such a thing happened in Turkey in, in, a year, in years. The border is bound to be bristling with uh, Turkish troops, and all the border crossings I've done, there's been complications. What's going on on the other side of that border right now? What is it like? Now it's um, somehow more risky 
uh, after the class in Ray Hanley. The closest fighting is uh, here, 35 kilometers uh, south. Where are we right now? We are here now. Mm -hmm. I think you can get a permission to pass from Akchakari. Classified the secondary aim is your job. The secondary aim. That's the secondary aim. The primary aim is that everybody goes home in exactly the same condition that we're all sitting here now. It's the most dangerous place for journalists in the world at the moment. Nobody really knows we're coming. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Last year, what was happening in Tessa Nilo National Park became such an embarrassment that the forestry minister was forced to pay a visit. He urged the people there to stop the destruction. <laughs> He has the power and the responsibility to pack up these words with action. But I've heard it hasn't exactly happened. The total park size right now on paper is, is 86,000 hectare. And how much is left now of that original area of the park? Right now, we estimate about 18,000 hectare of uh, a good forest left in the park. Everything else is either very degraded forest or open wastelands, open uh, brush areas, and most of it is, is palm oil plantation right now. Isn't the forestry department responsible for policing this kind of activity? Yes, the, the Ministry of Forestry is in charge of, of doing all the law enforcement. What happens? Most of the time, uh, nothing happens. If you look all around us now, we see all these patches of, of black soil all over the place, left, right, front, everywhere. It's all burn scars. They burn all the logs on the, on the ground here. This is horrifying. Look at that. They just cut them at the base, dropped the trees, burned everything. Right. Wow. If Indonesia's forestry minister won't even protect a national park, what hope is there for the rest of the country's forests? There is still smoldering. The yeah. fire and the smoke right. is still coming up over there. The guys are already setting the seedlings into the into the fresh black this, soil. This here. makes a complete joke out of the concept of national park. It's really sad. Eighty-six thousand hectare, and uh, it's hardly anything left. God. This is unbelievable. Oh, I can't wait to see the minister of forestry. I can't wait. Plainview, Texas is still reeling from the Cargill plant closure. To pay the bills, the city raised property taxes, and the school district lost over 200 students because so many families had to leave. Now Catherine Hayhoe is coming to town to talk about the drought that caused it all. People from all over are curious to hear what she has to say. You'd have to be a little bit crazy not to at least want to know a little bit more about it. I mean, she certainly, to me, is more credible than somebody like Al Gore, if we're going to pick on Al Gore. But she has uh, the same beliefs as I do, as far as from a Christian, you know, base deal. Nellie Montez even made the six-hour drive from San Antonio. 
I want to know what it is that really caused this drought. So when tomorrow or day after tomorrow, my kids say, well, you know, what is that? What, are, what were they talking about? I have some kind of answers, you know, because right now, nobody knows. Even my dad asked me, what's it about? I don't know what to tell him. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Katherine Hayo to the podium. One of the most incredible things about our planet is something that we see every day and we probably don't ever notice. It's our atmosphere. Just like a blanket on a cold night keeps us warm by trapping our body heat under the blanket, in the same way, our atmosphere keeps us 60 degrees warmer than we would be with no atmosphere. If we didn't have these little things of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, we'd be a frozen ball of ice. What's happening is we have this natural greenhouse effect here with this natural atmosphere, and we are adding an extra layer to it that was never intended to be there. When I look at the information that we get from the planet, I look at it as God's creation speaking to us. And in this case, there's no question that God's creation is telling us that it is running a fever. As I listen, I find myself wondering why faith and science always seem so far apart. Climate's changing because of what we're doing. There's no way around it. If there were more people like Catherine, maybe they wouldn't have to be. Did you get to meet Nellie? No, I didn't. No, this is but Catherine. I saw, I saw you nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm Nellie. I used to work at the Cargill plant. Oh, okay. She was just talking about how all the, that she hadn't really thought about. What? Well, tell me what you were. Just you know, like yeah. the things that you were saying that we can do as far as you know, taking some of that layer of blanket off. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Right there, I'm sitting there going, I didn't know. That. Wow, you know, I didn't know that. You know, uh -huh. when you have somebody that that believes the same way as you and is from this part of the, or has lived here for quite a while and is teaching at Texas Tech, you know, you see that conservative side of that telling you the message, it sure makes a lot of difference. It's about how it comes sometimes, not necessarily what it is. And it's hard to decouple those things. Father, your word lets us know in Jeremiah 29, 7, to pray for the peace and the prosperity of our city. And we pray for the peace and the prosperity, my God. Let God be exalted, God be exalted. We all believe that we were going to come together, pray about this, and something's going to change for Plainview. I had never heard of climate change. After hearing Catherine, I was just like, wow. Well, if we start using the right things and doing the right things, we could probably save our planet. We live for your glory, live for your glory. I naively thought that uh, I would study climate science until we fixed the problem and then I'd go back to astrophysics. <laughs> that was a long time ago. It was urgent when I started studying this problem and it's way more urgent today. And so until we have policies in place to actually start curbing our carbon emissions and reducing the impact we're having on our planet, I have to keep going. Once we cross the border, the signs of war are everywhere. Tom, nice to meet you. Thank you very much. منهم مسلحين ناس كثير يعني انضمت للثوار من أصدقائنا ومن قرايبنا ومن خواننا هذا ابن أخوي وهذا ابن ابن عمي يعني ابن أخوي وهذا أخوي وهذا ابن أخوي وهذا ابن أخوي وهذا ابني وهذا ابن أخوي وهذا ابن خالي. The commander tells me he used to be a cotton farmer, but when the drought hit, he had to turn to smuggling to feed his family. فيكذب لي النظام يسجني 
اطلع اخرى اشتغل بالتهريب لانه ولادي جوعانين. الجوع يخلى الواحد يساوي كل شيء يعني. سي ستارفن ميكس يو دو اني ثينج. طبعا كل حياتنا هي كذا. اول اوفر لايف اخوتي العاش طبعا احنا يعني انا افكر مرات انه مثلا الزراعه اخي مزارع فاشل، الثاني فاشل، الثالث فاشل، لا. When they write the history of the, this revolution, how important will the drought be? بني آدم مثل الحرباء يتأقلم مع كل الأجواء. أنت لمن الأرض قاحلة حكم الله ما تقدر ت... بس لمن تشوف إنه أنت محكوم من الرب هالحكم والأب منطيق ظهره بدك تصيح تقول جوعان فلمن تسمع إنه ما حدا استجاب بدك تزعل. فاحنا صار معانا الامور هاي كليتها فقمنا على الثوره وثوره حريه ثوره جياع After sharing a meal with the commander it's time to turn back it's dangerous to linger around here even this close to the border Later I'll find out that this town was taken over by Al Qaeda and that a hundred people were executed. As we leave, the words of the Syrian commander ring in my head. He called it a revolution of freedom and a revolution of the hungry. Droughts are nothing new. Neither are brutal dictators, religious conflicts, or people's desire for freedom. But for the Syrians who lived through it, the drought will be forever seared into their memories and forever shape their feelings toward the regime they now seek to overthrow. And the rest of us should take notice. This volatile part of the world is only getting hotter and drier. More droughts may mean more people displaced, more lives uprooted, perhaps more war. And we'd be very foolish to think it won't affect us.